hello, uh, hello again. Um, so with Ronald, we are very happy to talk about David. Uh, as you heard about it, uh, David is an AV1 decoder. Yes, that's a really good one. Um, um, it's been, been uh, uh, a common work with a lot of people, uh, of course, um, on AV1, right? Because AV1 is out, the spec is out, as uh, Scal and Jack just said. There is also an MTV spec. The TS spec is almost getting ready. We also have an AV1 uh, in RVI spec. Um, because some people got drunk uh, on Friday night, Thursday night uh, at the bar. Um, but um, the, there is a decoder currently that is LibOM, and it's not good enough, right? Um, why? Because, well, there is lots of issues. If you use it, you know why. Um, so the idea was to do uh, a professional and uh, production-ready uh, decoder, and not use the reference one. Words. That was used by research. It was exactly the same as LibVPX, VSS. FFPP9, where FFPP9 was so much better. Um, the idea was to do something that was uh, smaller binary, smaller memory footprint, and all the yada yada you want, cross platform, etc. Um, and actual open source, right? So, what are the fine prints? Uh, the fine prints is uh, it's a BSD license, um, and I'm sure I need to explain that a bit. Um, I, as you know me, I'm not really a fan of BSD license because I'm a copyleft guy, right? And it's quite unusual for VideoLand to have something that is BSD. However, um, for the same reason as Vorbis, LibVorbis, or Arcus, and because it's sanctioned by our god, uh, Richard Stallman, uh, it's completely fine to have a BSD license when you want your format to move and be used everywhere, right? Um, and that means that we need to be al to allow people to fork. Um, some, if we have like hardware manufacturer that wants to have hybrid decoders, they are allowed to take the decoder and fork it to just accelerate the, what they want. Because the goal is that the AV1 codec goes everywhere. Um, and if it's not, if it's LGPL, if it's linked to FFmpeg, a lot of those companies have lots of lawyers, and sometimes they have more lawyers than engineers, and they do care. Um, we don't. So let's. Bridget. Uh, also, like maybe some operating systems might want to ship AV1 by default, even if they are not really open source. Microsoft, if you're here. Um, so we need that. Um, it's of course a project that outside of FMPEG and Libby Codec, but it's been designed with a very simple API that basically it's done to work with Libby Codec, but it's not tainted by the LGPL license. <coughs> Um, and it's going to be a video and hosted project, uh, which is uh, good because it's a kind of neutral uh, sort of party compared to other uh, AOM members. So technical details. A lot of people heard that we were going to do it in Rust or in C++ 14 or 17. I know two guys in the, the room that would be happy about that. No, um, <laughs> it is not. Uh, it's C99 and not even the full C99. It's C99 minus the stuff that are not, uh, that are optional in C11. Um, no new extension, no Xilang extension, something very pure. No imprinting, sorry, like, no. Uh, we do like, we do an FFmpeg and it's 4 it's assembly files. Um, build system, yes. So no auto tools, good, <laughs> but no CMake or no custom configure that never works. Um, we're moving to Maison because it's the cool things. Um, and you're not going to hear me say good stuff about this streamer too often, but Maison is great and done correctly. Um, thanks for them. Uh, one of the reasons also to go to Maison is that um, people will be able to use that through Visual Studio almost directly. Uh, and maybe that works. However, um, that's for the library. In the repository, some tools will be there. You're allowed to, to, to give more C, uh, some more C tools, or even if you want to submit some REST tools, you're allowed to submit REST tools. Still no C++. Sorry, guys. Um, if you want to submit uh, some bindings or an MFT, for example, in Tint, uh, you're allowed to use C++. Um, and now uh, we're going to talk about uh, interesting stuff and complex stuff, so I let someone more clever than me. Thank you. Okay, so the um, last thing I want to add to that first is that as being part of, of VideoLand and being a VideoLand project, the VideoLand code of conduct and all of the rules that apply to VideoLand will apply to this project also. So. When he kicks you out, he means it for this project also. We're gonna be nice kids, not assholes. Okay, let's talk technically now. So, the things that we care about is that it's small, fast, efficient, and all of these things. So I'm gonna start with the results, 
And then after that, I'll show some of the more inter technically and interesting details on how we implemented that. Specifically, I'm going to show several slides on how the threading is implemented, because it's innovative and new and different, except for Tim, who told me that is very boring. And he's right, but that's because he's too smart. So <laughs> hopefully the rest of you will find it interesting. Interesting. Okay. So, um, technical details. So, the first thing that is important is that it's small. So, um, in terms of source code, it is actually really small. So, even if you take away the whole encoder from libaom, we're talking about close to 300,000 lines of code. It, that's just way too much. So, we got that down to about 10% of that. And that's, I think that's a really interesting thing. <laughs> We did this for FLVP9 also, and the effect of that is that people actually start looking at that implementation, not necessarily as an authoritative reference, but as something where they can look things up. Like, oh, how does that work, right? What is the quickest way to look up how something works? You look in a small, easy to understand code base, and we hope that this can be that code base. Okay, secondly, binary size. Binary size is important because every time you download an iPhone application, the first thing you do is that you curse why on earth is a stupid photo sharing app 50 megabytes. So we're trying to help and get that down. That's not just for iPhone apps, that's also for browsers, right? Because you download a new browser every two weeks. Um, lastly, memory footprint, right? This is a big deal because you will often open a website and it just happens to embed 10 videos in the corner somewhere and you're probably not even looking at those videos. But it will run and load them anyway. Right? The memory footprint of AOM is, for a 1080p sequence, 160 megabytes. That is a lot, and if you multiply that by a couple of tabs open, a couple of videos in each of those tabs, your Chromebook will eventually explode. So um, our memory footprint is about a quarter of that. Also, importantly, stack usage is minimal. Right? So stack usage is, is maybe one kilobyte or two kilobytes, and I think for AOM we're talking about Hundreds of megabytes. A couple hundred megabytes. Yeah, it, it, it's, it's, it's hard to manage. Okay, so um, that's, that's it in terms of footprint. Okay, honestly, most, most normal people don't care so much about the footprint. It's just something that people have in, have in the back of their mind, right? Is my computer going to explode? What we care about is speed, right? Can I play 4K? The answer is mm, almost. <laughs> right, so um, the numbers here are from 1080p. And I'm going to add an asterisk here that um, these, most of the lines that you will look at here, um, and they're annotated as such, are from C-only runs of each of the decoders. The reason for that is that we currently only have a C version of our decoder. So a fair comparison is to compare it to other C versions. I will show some D versions, so factorized, optimized, right, Intel AVX2 optimized versions at the same time. But our decoder is not yet optimized in that way. We'll work on that over the next couple of weeks. Okay, so having said that, let's look at the CPU runtime of each piece. So uh, in this graph, uh, let's start at the left. You have uh, five lines, or up at the left is really only three of them. Single threaded, David C, versus single threaded libaom, either the C version or the CD version. And what you can see is that we're about 60% faster. Uh, this is the 1.0 tag release of libaom, right? So I want to be very specific about which version that is, and it's running on Haswell Arc architecture. Uh, going from 10 to 16 FPS, single threaded is in and by itself not that interesting, right? Because most 1080p materials for the FPS or 60 FPS, so it still doesn't actually work. Um, secondly, you can see that the SIMD version of libaom, and this is one that is that only has like 50% SIMD coverage at this point is about 50% faster. So it's still slower than our C version, right? Which is kind of surprising, but then again, if it only has 50% CD coverage, it, it sort of does make sense. Okay, so that's it for the single threaded part. So how much faster the C version? 60% faster. Uh, then we go to multi-threading. So the way that multi-threading in libaom works is that you uh, split the image in tiles, right? And, and tiles are not the same as extendable tiles, but something different. Tiles is just split the image in like two or four equal parts, and you decode each of them independently, right? And that means that one core can do one half, and one core can do the other half. If you do that, theoretically speaking, it should be almost twice as fast. Um, so let's look at the uh, libaom results first. Right, the purple line here at the bottom, you can see that we've going from one to two tiles, it goes from 
just under 10 to like about 15 FPS. And if you go up to four tiles, it goes to 20 FPS, right? That's, so for four tiles, you get a 2x speed up, and you still don't get 30 FPS, so it still doesn't work. But if you add CD to it, which is the light blue line over there, you actually get to about like 34 FPS. That's, that's just about right, right? So, so as long as you don't go video player around it, like video lamp, it will actually be real time. So it will still not be real time, but it's close enough. Okay, um, so we do our multi-threading a little bit differently, and like I said, I'm gonna go into more detail like a few slides from here. So we have tile threading and frame threading, and that in by itself is quite interesting, right? FFmpeg has that for FFV9 also. But unlike FFmpeg, we allow you to combine these two together, and in fact, we intend for you to combine these two together. Right, so if each of those gives like a two, two and a half x speed up, then together they will give about like a six x speed up. And that will get you to 4K at 60 FPS, with or without CD. Okay, so um, these runs were done on a very simple four core laptop, so basically the performance caps out at four, at, at four cores. But what you can see is that in the dark blue line, if you just enable tiling, we are, we, we, we cap out at about 32 FPS. With just frame threading, going from one to two or four threads, you get about 40 FPS. And if you combine that, the, just, just the, the point you see in the middle on the top there, just two frame threads and two tile threads, you can see that they really, uh, that they work together really nicely. And even with just two by two threads, you get to 45 FPS. Right? And at that point, it doesn't go much further because this is an, an old crappy laptop, but um, you can actually get 50 FPS for a C decoder. And that is really impressive, right? Because now um, we want to go, we want to basically give you a projection. What can you expect going forward, right? Like a couple of weeks from now, we'll have AVX2 optimizations. How fast will it be? Um, so um, I'm going to answer that indirectly by comparing it to other decoders we already have. And just at the same time, give you some sort of a general idea of some complexity of AV1 versus other codecs. So, on the left, the, the, the first two bars are the same data points from the previous one, right? So it's about like 10 and 16 FPS for like a Ram and David C version single threaded. If you compare that with um, the TPX and like, or the HFC, HFC4 decoders and FFmpeg, you can see that their C speed is a lot higher. Um, that's, that's, that's no surprise, right? These are exactly the numbers that you would expect. So now, if you compare the blue bars to the red bars, you can get a general indication of how much faster an, a CD version is compared to a C version. So for 264, the speed up is about 2x. That's not so much of a surprise because 264 has very small lock sizes, and so the really wide registers that APX2 gives you, in most cases, you don't really use them. Right, then, um, HEVC is not fully optimized, so let's ignore that one. But FFVP9 with VPX, you can see that we get almost 90 FPS, whereas the C version was only, only what was it, like, like 35 or 25 FPS. So the speed that you get from SIMD is about three, a little more than 3x. Um, and that is for a codec that only has one post filter. So AV1 has multiple post filters, which are all CDable. So the theoretically expected speed up from AVX2 for, for AV1 is about 4x. So if you get 50 FPS with uh, four threads on this system with a C decoder, then the expected performance is about 200 FPS with an, uh, with an AVX2 version. Right? So can you do 4K at 60? Yes, you can. So that, that, that will be done hopefully in a couple of weeks from now, right? So what we're showing here is just the C version, and uh, we're going to be releasing that later also. Okay, so um, I want to show one of the interesting implementation details of this decoder, and that's uh, the threading, right? So uh, I mentioned earlier that we have, just like FFVP9, we have tile threading and we have frame threading, and we actually managed to combine those. And um, unless you're Tim, that's that's quite exciting. And I don't think any other encoder has ever done that has ever done that before. At least no no open source one that I've seen. So, um, and I want to sort of show how we did that, just to get people excited to um, look at the code, contribute to the code, maybe some patches, uh, whatever it is that you do to show interest and and, and you know be be part of this. Okay. So um, the left. 
uh, pane there, it shows our general public API. Right, and this is about as simple as it goes. So there's an open, there's a close, and there's a decode frame. Right, and this, this just runs in your application or in, in FFM, like whatever it is that you use to, to actually wrap this in, decoder in. Um, and then on the right, uh, I'm going to show you basically a general proxy code on what's going on inside the decoder. So the first thing that it does is that it just parses the header, right? All of this is not multi threaded, this is very straightforward. So if you understand how the header parsing works, um, so we're going to sort of skip over that, and then um, the, uh, the, the, there's an internal function called submit frame, which is um, sort of this transition part where um, the frame data is handed over, so one block of bytes that represents one uh, visible <coughs> frame is handed over from the main thread into a frame thread. And we'll have multiple of those frame threads running concurrently, each of them decoding a different frame. So that's one level of multi-threading that we have. Um, so that, that's uh, the, the orange pane that you see over here. Um, that, that's frame thread. Um, most of what it does is not that interesting, right? So frame is split up in tiles, right? So it's literally just a for loop. Let's scan the tiles vertically. Let's scan the blocks vertically. Let's, let's scan the, the tiles horizontally. Right? That's really all it does. It just wraps a couple of for loops. And then it does multi-pass decoding, and that's basically how we um, solved um, entropy dependency issues. All right, so let's, let's look at this for a second, right? So um, in AV1, um, one of the things that um, HVC, for example, doesn't have, but VP9 did, is that the entropy state, that is um, the, the, the probabilities, like how symbols are coded in a bit stream, um, is adapted after every frame, or in AV1, even after every symbol. And the output state at the very end, after the very last pixel of the frame has been decoded, that is the input of the beginning of the next frame. Right? And you can see how that is a problem if you want to do multi-threading, right? Because if you want to do multi-threading, I want to start the next frame when the previous frame starts, not when the previous frame finishes, because otherwise I have no multi-threading and the whole exercise would be very pointless. So a way to solve that is two-pass decoding. So what two-pass decoding means is that I have one pass where I scan all the symbols. And then I have a second pass where I do the actual reconstruction. Right? So symbol coding is simply where I parse my bits through my array of bytes from a disk from, from a WebM file. And I look at what intraprediction mode was it, or what motion vector was it. And then I have a second pass where I actually look at what is the value of that motion vector, right? like what reference frame did it point into, what pixels do those represent, and I actually paint those pixels in the current block. And I do the same things for the coefficients, the residual, but I'm, and, and where I actually reconstruct a visible frame. So by splitting the symbol parsing from the reconstruction, I can make frame threading a, a real possibility again. Does that make sense? Somewhat? Very good. Okay, so now that now, now that that's theoretically out of the way, um, the second uh, the, the, the the second part of the parallelization that we have is the tile multi-threading, right? And so the tile multi-threading is simply where I can split an image in multiple parts, and each of those can be parsed as well as reconstructed completely and independently of all of the other ones. So tiles within a frame do not refer to each other, and so we're doing that too. And obviously, if you add those things together, you get two levels of parallelization that just multiply with each other. So instead of a two and a half speed up, you get a two and a half squared speed up, which is more than two and a half. Um, so uh, there, there, there's some proxy codes uh, over here, and, and I'm gonna sort of like skip over that. Uh, the, so what happens in class one is that this, this structure that you see on the left um, is filled with symbols. Um, and this thing is exactly 32 bytes. Um, we try to get it as small as possible. I think 32 is about the minimal thing. And getting this thing as small as possible, the memory footprint of the application is actually so low. Right? Because this structure exists, in the worst case, for every 4x4 four four is 16 pixels in the picture. So for every pixel in the picture, you need two bytes of this structure. Otherwise, the decoding process just cannot work. So to get the memory footprint low, getting this thing to be as small as possible is one of the critical design uh, considerations that we need to take into account. Okay, so 
pass one is basically just read the bitstream and fill this thing for the whole frame. Now, the thing about pass one, right, is that it blocks all subsequent threads. Because the pass one of the next thread can only start when the pass one of the previous thread has been completed. The interesting thing of having tileability of uh, the combined for frame threading is that each tile can be combined, can, can be decoded independently, right? So I want you to think of a, of a file that has many tiles. Let's say that we've got eight tile rows and eight tile columns. Pass one can then spawn 64 threads, and each of those can, can go entirely independently. The reason that that's important is that, let, let, let's say hypothetically, that you have 50% of your runtime in pass one and 50% of your runtime in pass two. If pass one can be multi-threaded 64 times, then the overall runtime of that thing, the wall clock time, will not be 50% anymore. It will just be like 1%, which means you can actually have 50 frame threads active next to each other, right? Even though the complexity of pass one and pass two is equal. So, the part where pass one blocks the subsequent thread is fixed just automatically by tile multi-threading. And that's why it's, uh, it, the, the multi-threading scales so much better if you combine frame plus tile threading. So for pass two, none of this is the case. And the reason for that is very simple, is that in pass two, the reconstruction, you have to refer to pixels from the previous frame. Um, pass two, includes a, the post-filter processing, so the deblock, the CDEF, the loop restoration, and those are in untiled linear processes that can, can run over the whole frame from top to bottom. And so multi-threading for the post-filter can be done at a different level, but not at the tiling level. And, and so at the end of the day, your, your post-filter will not be multi-threadable in terms of tiles uh, tile rows times tile columns. It would just only be multi threadable in one dimension. So the, what, what that means is that at the end, let's say that we're, we're taking a crazy um, idea, right? Like eight by eight tile rows and tile columns. So you will have 64 threads in, in pass one. Pass two will then just have eight threads active. But you can do that for, let's say, eight frames in a row. So what that means is that you will always have one thread or one frame active with 64 threads in pass one, you will have eight threads active with eight threads in pass two. So the two sort of like equal out, but at the same time, while equaling out, and they, 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 they balance, but they scale really well and they do decrease the runtime exactly as you would expect as you add more threads. So the key thing here is use approximately as many tile threads as frame threads, and scaling will basically improve the other one, which is, which is a really interesting thing. Um, and, and the numbers earlier showed that that's the case. Okay, so uh, that's about it. So um, I, I hope the thread made sense. Uh, you can ask me questions later on if you want to learn more details about how that was done. Okay, um, so what now? So if everything goes correctly, uh, you have the source code today. Um, let's consider that as a 0 .0 0.0.1. Um, it's not prediction ready. Um, it will be soon, uh, but um, there is still a lot of work, but we're not going to keep it closed um, because, well, we want to access it. Um, so almost the, the important stuff are done. There is a lot of small stuff to finish um, around uh, platform porting, uh, about uh, field grain, and of course, SIMD, right, to make it faster. Uh, of course, more testing is needed, uh, more fuzzing. Uh, this is something we not talk, but we want to fuzz that correctly and quite a bit, uh, because that's uh, going to be important in the future so that Firefox doesn't have to get pwned every time they ship a, a, a decoder, a new decoder, right? Um, we need you. We need you. We need you guys to help. Uh, we need you to test it. We need to compile it on uh, exotic platforms like uh, Windows on ARM64. Martin, if I found your laptop somewhere. Um, we need people who like to write assembly. Um, writing assembly is not difficult. Uh, we had students who were in high school at NCI a few years ago write assembly for X264. It's not difficult. It's just the first first function you're going to take two days, the next one you're going to take one day, and after you do one every 10 minutes. So please help us. Um, we need that in all the platforms, and we need you to test it. If you're a web browser, we need you to use it. Uh, so Firefox, Chrome people, uh, please tell us how we should improve. 
um, if you are uh, someone else or hardware company or anything uh, related to that, if you need modifications so that it runs correctly or better in your hardware, tell us how we could cooperate. Um, if you're MPV, please use it. Um, if you're VLC, well, we already have a patch. Um, if you have money, uh, please send some money so we can have bounties to uh, <coughs> improve the, the code further. Um, and we don't have questions, so the questions will be during the next break. Okay? Thank you very much.